one of the actual like big sessions do we go on site. Almost all of what I do is remote. Okay, perfect. Great. So um, I think everyone's joined us now. I just caught the end of our conversation. But um, thanks for joining our session on um, making mastering sales training in a hybrid workspace. Uh, so I think the last session just finished, so it's probably going to take a few minutes to switch over um, from the previous session. And while we give everyone time to, to enter, we can start with some um, introductions. Uh, so I can start with myself. I'm the CEO here at Wonderway. Um, I actually didn't talk about what we did in my opening session, but for those of you who don't know, we built sales training software, um, proven to increase revenue per rep. Um, and, you know, we, the idea between our company, behind our company, is that we hook in CRM systems and use the data from the CRM system to take the guessing game out of the training process. Um, so, yeah, I think with that, I'm super excited with the, the, the two people that I've got on the call today. Uh, Deepak is a, uh, a full-time backpacker who's built um, a massive sales team over the last couple of years. Um, while well, he's been moving around different countries. Um, so super keen to hear how that's been going. And of course, James Buckley, who uh, is not just training people, but creating content that trains the training, that trains the trainers, that defines you know, the, some of the trends in the industry. So I think super exciting to have these two on the call um, and get insights for you know, what they've been seeing um, happening over the last couple of years and, and you know, what are the keys to making this work. So um, I just start a short introduction, but maybe um, Deepak would be interesting to hear a little bit more about you and, and you know, what your, your journey has been around this tr training and working remotely. Thank you for the intro, Ban. I appreciate it. So yeah, I am a full-time backpacker. I've been backpacking and working remotely and living the digital nomad life uh, before it became yeah. cool or the norm for the past five and a half years. Um, it's been, a, it's been a wild ride. It's been a lot of fun building a, a team whilst being location independent and hiring people across different time zones and different geographic locations. And uh, yeah, I'm currently heading the inbound sales uh, lead feeder and I have about 13 people working under me. Cool. And, and where are you? Where are you right now? Currently in London, the UK. I'm heading to yeah. Italy next week, France the week after that, Ireland the week after that then heading back to the UK for a fresh chair, fresh change of clothes and then heading to Spain and potentially Morocco after that. That's awesome. So it's going to be yeah. a, a lot of traveling for the next couple of months. I love that. I've been traveling around quite a lot as well since we went remote. Um, I think, I think it works fine, except the, the only challenge is sometimes, you know, the internet connection is probably the one thing is like, it just sucks when you go somewhere and you, you don't get the right internet connection, but otherwise I think it, it works perfectly. But yeah, how do you get around that when you, you're full-time backpacking? I'm super curious. So I usually like to stay in Airbnbs. And prior to me booking somewhere, I'd get in touch with the host and then just ask them whether they can send me a screenshot of speed test. And if it's something reasonable, something that I can work with and, and good enough for me to make video calls, then I usually go with that. If there's no Airbnbs available, then I look into hotels and then see whether they even, either have a, a business working center or if there's any co-working spaces close by. So there's a lot of options that you can take. Awesome. And, and James, how about you? I mean, you've been working, I think every time I've seen a video of you, you've always got that pool table in the background. So I don't think you, you're, you're full-time traveling as much as Deepak, but I know you've been working remote for quite a few years. So, so share your journey. I, I would say that I've been remote almost 100% uh, for the better part of the last two years. But my first four years were spent in an office at a SaaS company. Uh, but I started as an SDR going in cold calling, cold outreach. Uh, and then I became a, a BDR director and I had like a whole team. And then from there, I moved to another company that was based out of New York. So that's when I started working from home. Uh, but in that time, I traveled quite a bit from event to event. So I've done, we were talking before we kicked this off. I've done 97 SaaS sales events conferences in my seven years, eight, almost eight years in the space. Wow. Yeah. So if you imagine what that is, it's typically three to four days a week that you're at an event because these conferences go multiple days. So you're at a hotel working remote for the most part on the times that you're not engaged at the event. And that's kind of a work-life balance on the road that you sort of have to adapt over time. But here's what it gave way to is I learned how to be really productive while being mobile. I started to be really good at doing the things I would usually have to do on a laptop over my, my mobile device, my phone. 
uh, you know, and that became like, okay, what can I do on my phone that I normally have to do on my laptop? And if I can do it, then great. Like it's one less thing I have to worry about opening up my laptop, connecting to the Wi-Fi, logging into my shit, right? Like, I don't, like, I don't want to have to go through that process if I can avoid it. So let's do it on the phone. And I, I would often try to look for, for solutions there. And that was really helpful for me. But I would say that, yes, for the better part of the last two years, I've been almost 100% remote outside of visiting offices, delivering sessions and coaching stuff and the events, of course, that we put on at in cities all over the country. So, yeah, yeah that's awesome. I'd, I'd also be curious, uh, Nazar, if you're in the chat, maybe you can drop a poll in. Um, I think I wanted to do a poll to understand where people, how many people um, in the audience, whether they're working hybrid or fully remote, um, or, or maybe you've got a couple of people who are actually in the office and just curious um but uh yeah be cute keen to hear like the poll and if there's any um stories that you want to share in the chat then feel free to, to jump in and share your own story i mean from my side then we um like the rest of the world we went remote when um covid hit and then we stuck with it after that uh you know i think it, uh, when covid hit a few people decided to move away my co-founder actually moved to hamburg we were based in berlin at the time so from that point forward we were fully committed um, and yeah, I mean, I love it. I've, I've got two small kids that I had since COVID. I've spent 10 times more time with them. I think, you know, being a founder, running a small startup, um, it's pretty time consuming and I just wouldn't have spent as much time with them. So I, I absolutely love the opportunity to spend time with them and to travel, but it also has, um, massive challenges that I think we, we're still, um, still uncovering some of them now. Um, but yeah, I think, um, let's start off with that. So let's talk a bit about these challenges. Um, yeah, what, what are the major challenges that you guys are seeing? Um, you know, what are the major challenges, especially yeah, working remotely, but especially as it relates to training training people um, uh, in a remote environment? What are the biggest ones you guys are seeing? So I'd say we the way we proceed with the challenges is to split them into two buckets. So there's challenges for the reps, and then there's challenges for the managers. So we, if we start off with the challenges for the reps, uh, there's definitely the loneliness or the isolation piece. A lot of people. Uh, perhaps are not self-starters or they just need that camaraderie or other people around them to be able to perform or, or at least uh, keep morale up for the long run. I think that's definitely a factor that, that comes into play when someone is thrown into working remotely and uh, they're not sure what to get into. And after the honeymoon period, which is the first couple of weeks, you're excited to work from home or from wherever you feel like. And after that, that loneliness factor can kick in. If you don't have a, a support group around you or, or people uh, to, to hang out with after work, I was just, I was just typing I was just typing in here too. A strong routine will help as well. Um, you know, it's important that you have these flows that you know that you have to go through every day. For example, every day I know that I'm going to have to come in and I'm going to have to get down to inbox zero in my social media platforms where inbound comes in and my my email where follow ups and uh, mid mid funnel deals might be responding and invites might be getting back to me saying, Hey, I want to invite my team to this webinar you're doing. Uh, so I know that there is a period of time in my morning that 100% has to be cleared up so that I can get down to a point where I can be productive. I have to get, I have to get to that point. That kind of routine tends to help people to stay productive in that work from home environment, that hybrid environment where you kind of get that complacency. You're like, ho-hum, this is this is boring. I don't have anybody to talk to. There's no no one in here to fail with me, right? We can't laugh when I have a, a crappy call together. You know, that's an important factor. So I totally support what you're saying there. Yeah. Just, just yeah, out of curiosity, think... James, do you use uh, calendar blocking to get those tasks done? Massive. Yeah. Uh, cal so I do, I do two things, and this is a good suggestion for everybody, a tactical takeaway, right? Uh, task management plus time blocking equals stress-free routine. Right. That I don't care what you have to use. And I, I always tell people that you actually run two types of pipelines. The first one is a pipeline full of tasks that have to get done. And this, the second one or vice versa, depending on your priority or role, I wear a lot of hats. So I have to balance really well. But but that's the first pipeline you run. And the other pipeline is actual revenue generation pipeline as a frontline rep. Whichever the priority is for you during that moment is fine. But you manage both of those pipelines. So you have to allocate and time block on your calendar time that is dedicated to working both of those pipelines. If you do not do this, you will constantly feel behind and you'll probably miss your number. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think most sales reps are, are, are used to, um, 
you know, <laughs> their life is dictated by their calendar naturally because they're, they're used to having a lot of inbound. But I think, um, you know, th there's a lot more responsibility here to, to you know, take, I think a lot of reps, sales reps are used to having their sort of calendars dictated by other people, but being more proactive with how you're planning that time out and providing structure to your day, um, you know, and, and just having a routine that, that no matter where you are, what you're doing, you're always you checking time in. block the time to set up the time. It sounds crazy. <laughs> it sounds crazy. But if you take an hour at the end of every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m., if that's when your day is, you know, quote, done. I know we're always working, right? I, I, people need to stop saying I work from home and they need to start saying I live at work. Uh, <laughs> right? So, so if you take the time from 4 to 5 on a Friday – and look ahead to next week. And you want to look at both your tasks and your revenue pipeline. And then you want to look and you say, okay, well, I know that I'm going to have to work at these for at least an hour every day next week, both of them, to be able to get everything, keep the momentum going, keep prospecting, if you will, keep moving people to the next stage in my cycle. If you look ahead and allocate that time ahead of time, guess what? No one schedules that time. Yeah. And now the time is there and you can dedicate that hour consistently to those two pipelines and you will stay ahead of the game or at least caught up depending on how productive you can be in an hour. I can do a lot of shit in an hour. <laughs> yeah. If you don't own your calendar, it'll end up owning you. So definitely keep on top of the way you manage your time. But I, I want to come back to some of the points you made before Deepak, because I think they're were, they were really good. But I, I think something just, I just want to interject quickly. I know we're talking about training, but I, I think also, um, you know, an important point here is also hiring the right people for, the, for working remotely. Um, we found like when we went remote, we, we hired a lot of people in the office and then we went remote. Um, not everybody enjoyed it. Uh, and, you know, some people loved it, other people didn't. And, you know, now that we're fully remote, we, we really make sure that we're hiring people who, who can work in this environment, who can be proactive, who are going to block their time, who are going to get out of the house and, and have, you know, good social interactions. Um, but I think, hiring people like now in our interview process we sit down with people and especially for like the sdr role which i think is the hardest job out of any of them to be doing at home because you might not be talking to people at least in, as an ae you're probably doing video calls all day but like we sit down with the bdrs we show them a calendar um that we give them around like how we recommend you structure your day like and it's time blocked to every minute of the day basically and we really go through every section and we say hey you know, can you imagine yourself sitting there in your bedroom or wherever it's going to be? Like, where are you going to be sitting? And can you sit there and do, you know, a one hour power hour? Um, cold calling people from your bedroom. Like, and are you going to sit there every day and, and batch these power hours out? Um, do you have good internet? Do you, are you comfortable with this? Like, and really trying to get them into the zone because there's no point in lying to people. Like, if you hire them and you give false expectations and then they get in there and they, they hate it, then, um, you know, you've just wasted everybody's time. So I think like setting really clear expectations up front and making sure, you know, if they, they're proactive, but also showing them what's your expect and helping them to plan that time, I think is super important. Uh, yeah, that, that's a really good point. One of the traits that I look for when I'm hiring people is, is are they self-motivated? Can they push themselves when things will look bleak? Because like you said, the SDR role is a grind. It will be a good times. And a lot of bad times, unfortunately. So how you push yourself through those bad times is what's really going to matter. And I think that motivation needs to come from within. Like for sure, there can be external factors that give you like a short burst of motivation. But for the most part, you need to have your North Star. You need to know what you're aiming for in life and where do you want to get to. And that's what I really look for someone when I'm hiring for, for junior people. Like are they motivated? Are they able to push themselves when times are tough? Because they will be there. I think, I think hiring is one challenge that leaders are facing. I think there's another challenge that's difficult for them to be consistent with, and that's this delivery of new tactics and new techniques consistently to develop the seller over time. There is always this expectation that your leader just has it all figured out. They just know exactly, they just know exactly what to tell you, right? If I go to them and I say, what do I say if someone says this? They're going to tell me what I should say. And then I'm just going to spit it back out exactly the same way. This is like a false narrative that we've created around what it is to develop as a sales professional. The truth is very few leaders do have it figured out, but they have experience that they draw from and they share that wisdom with you. But you've got to turn around and make that your own. So there's this leadership struggle of like, how do I constantly put new techniques and new tactics in front of my sellers one, that are going to work or at least have a high likelihood of working, that have some data that's to support that they work. 
and two, that they're going to be able to execute and understand and then adopt as their own methodologies, tactics, techniques, and best practices. I think that is one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing leaders face in 2022. How do I create a universal language for our sales process and the way that we sell to customers in a remote environment when half of my team is in Germany and the other half is in Bangladesh? How do I make this happen? This is very, this is very challenging. So I think we're yeah. seeing this become quite a focal point as we move forward into this more hybrid and a more remote environment. Yeah, I think it also touches on some of the things that Deepak was saying at the start, that like when you're sitting in an office, then, then it kind of just, you can rub off on people, you know, that you can hear each other, the person next you to you talking. Culture. You can, you can you hear, you know, as a manager, you can hear your rep making calls and you're listening in and giving them feedback. Um, the reps themselves are listening to the manager speak or hearing to other reps and they're like, oh, that's a good idea. I might try that next. And I think, you know, people start to talk in a similar way naturally, but in, in a remote environment, that doesn't happen. Like it has to be, it has to be, it's completely forced and it has to come from the manager or the, the leadership team who's standardizing these things and making this available. And I, I think this is like one of the biggest, biggest challenges, especially for sales leaders who maybe, uh, um, you know, maybe they're a little bit lazy when it comes to documenting things. I feel like documentation is a very important part here because it's very hard to do that one-on-one -on -one with every single person and constantly repeating yourself. But I think here it requires like a more discipline for the manager to be actually taking the time to think through the processes, to write them down, to, to follow up on them, to make sure that people are, are, are doing them, which I, you know, I think a lot of sales leaders, this might not be a skill or something that they've had to do in the past. You know, they've maybe been a good sales rep who's been winging it um, as a rep, closing a lot of deals, but now they have to kind of, document this down and that's not something that a skill that everybody has um, there's another layer too of that and that's art you can make sure they're doing them but are they doing them just to do them or are they doing them because there's meaning behind it right if i i think sellers have to own their role too and realize their true worth right they are the first impression the tip of the spear the first experience that a customer often has with a company is their own research, right? They, you know, we've all heard the crazy unsupported statistic that buyers are 70% of the way through the sales cycle before they talk to a seller. We've all heard this, right? I don't know if it's true or not. I could care less if it's true, to be frank with you. I think 99% of data is made up on the spot anyway. So <laughs> we can, we can, that's a statistic unto itself, right? So the, the irony is not lost on me there. But when you look at that, that what does that mean? That means that the first time they talk to a salesperson, they're gonna that's gonna set the tone for what they can expect as a client moving forward if they decide to move forward. You only get one shot at that moment. And sellers have to realize their worth in that moment and then know what to say, when to say, how to say like Batman, all the tools in the tool belt, right? I need the right tool for the right prospect. So it's probably a bigger conversation there, but they sellers have to own the process. There's an origin and that's their leadership, but then they have to own and fall in love with their process that works for them. The pragmatism is what they're looking for. What works for me as a seller for this type of buyer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, I, I guess this comes back to what the whole conversation we had before about finding the right people that are going to take that ownership, right? That, um, you know, it's working from home, you it has amazing benefits. You can travel the world. You can spend time with your family. You, you don't have to commute, but I think you need to invest the time that you've saved on the commute or the time that you're saving on, on water cooler talk or whatever. Um, and you need to be investing that time into working harder to make it work. I think the, the, the expectations actually go up. Um, you know, I think some people see it as a benefit where it's like, oh, I'm going to knock off early and not take this seriously. But I think you, if you're going to, have this benefit you also need to work for it and that's something that that i don't I think, think there's this fallacy where people say. just assume that you can just start working from home uh, it's it's a matter of like yeah you, you're gonna you're told to start working from home but it's a question of setting up processes to actually make sure that working from home works for you specifically as an individual so things like time blocking and kind of setting up a routine and then just making sure how yeah. you get the most out of your working day by doing so. But it, it's not something that's just going to come out of, the, out of the box and work the same way it does for me uh, as, as it may do for you. So but it's teaching just everybody the process and the tools, though, that's the part that I think makes a lot of sense for leaders is mm -hmm. if I'm constantly putting my, this process in front of you and then I'm highlighting all the different tools that we're going to use through this process. If you're a seller, if I, and I'm using five tools, you know, 
for my process. You know, let's say we're using Salesforce as my CRM and HubSpot for my marketing automation and SalesLoft for my Cadence software and Calendly or Chili Piper for my, my schedule. These people don't innately know these software platforms. So teaching them a process is one piece of it. Oh, and then you send your calendar invite. Okay, well, I, I know a lot of college graduates that are coming into sales professions and their first thing out of their mouths when I connect with them and they're two months in is, I've never had to work a calendar before. So there's this like disconnect between teaching someone a process and making sure they know the tech stack so that they can build that process so they can understand the flow of that process. So hiring managers are always saying, I don't care if they don't have experience. What does that mean? If somebody doesn't know how to effectively write an email because they don't know how to hit compose and start and adjust their signature and add links, that's a huge learning ramp. Hmm. Yeah. that you're and, not and expecting the, <laughs> and this is, this is the sort of stuff as well where it's so much easier to just tap someone on the shoulder if you're in the office and say hey like you know to the to your buddy next to you or you whatever hey like i'm having trouble with this how do you do this and it's easy to look over the shoulder whereas now you have to like schedule time for a call you can sit down go through this or maybe you know being more proactive you can record record these sorts of sessions as training mm -hmm. and make it available to people but yeah well, don't forget to allocate time for yourself too. That's one of the benefits of working from home, right? You could take that same time block that you just created for cold calling and you could just go ahead and do like a quick 30 minute one right after that for walking outside for a second, clear your brain, come back to it fresh 30 minutes later. That's probably one of the most important things I started doing when I started working remote is just putting blocks on my calendar in between crazy ass calls that just said, hold, just, yeah. just hold for a second so that I could have a moment to breathe, right? <laughs> like if you don't do this, you, you drive yourself crazy. You constantly feel like you're in the hustle and you never want to yeah. feel that way. So I'm just conscious of time. Maybe we should also, we need to make sure we have enough time for the solution. So let me skip to the next slide. Um, I, I also look at the poll. So um, the poll that we put out, I can see that 55% of the people in the session are working fully remote, 36 hybrid and 9% from the office. So. Hopefully, the, uh, what we're saying is is resonating with everybody. Like, um, jump in if you crazy disagree with anything we've said. Um, we're happy to take it up. <laughs> happy to take it up if you've had different experiences. Um, uh, but yeah, I think you know. I guess everyone. Hopefully, this is ringing true for you as well. Um, so yeah, when it comes to solutions, like Deepak, like what are the the um, the the key things that you've done in your team that that help solve some of these problems? Um, so a couple, I'll just throw a couple out and then I can go uh, into them in more detail. So things like making sure that one to have one to ones have a very clear agenda. So people know exactly what they, what they're expecting before the call and they can then prepare for the call. And then when the call does take place, kind of steering away from questions that lead to answers that one can usually pick out of the CRM. Like if you can already take it from the dashboard, there's no point in asking that, just wasting everyone's time. So asking things like, you know, what's the best call you've had this week? Uh, what's, what's a deal that you need help with? Uh, what's slowing you down as, as an individual? It could be something personal, it could be something work-related as well, just to show people that you know you, you do care for the people that you've hired, you care for their well-being. Um, and then what's something new that you want to focus on? So if you have weekly check-ins, there might be something that you want to help people work with on, on a weekly level or on a monthly level, but at least that way you know what's going through their heads and where you may be able to assist them. Um, so that would be one of the first ones when it comes to one-to-ones and meetings. Uh, listening to sales calls uh, as well. That, that's one way to kind of get down on the field with them. So when you're in an office, like you well said, you can listen to people speaking on the spot. It's a bit harder to do in a remote environment. So listening to sales calls, you can pick at random and that way you'll catch people off guard and they're not preparing for it. And if they know that that one's not going to be specifically recorded, uh, developing a, a peer learning system, uh, a coaching program, an ongoing coaching program as well. And just, uh, making sure you have a uh, you set up an environment where people feel very comfortable in sharing information. Uh, it's very hard to do in a remote environment. There's, there's, you, know, you can't really read people's body language. You don't know what people are going through. So making sure people feel comfortable in sharing what they're going through, both personally and professionally. So having an, an open environment where people can ultimately express themselves. Yeah. Good. I want to dig into a couple of things there. So you said that like you don't want to sit there and talk about stuff that's already in the CRM system. You want to prepare. Like mm -hmm. I think some one, one thing that's challenging. We often hear this from our customers as well is um, that there's actually like too much data available sometimes. Like you know you've got the CRM, you've got your outreach, you've got Gong, you've got all these tools, and everything is is so much different data coming from everywhere. Like how 
how do you get around that? Like how much preparation time do you put in and, and what are the data points you're looking at? Like, do you try and analyze it all yourself before every one on one? Or do you ask your reps to, to sort of, you know, suggest things that they should be focusing on? Or how do you manage You can that? ask them to bring things to the call. Um, and then, of course, having so many data sources means that you can essentially automate a lot of this data being delivered to you. So you don't have to go researching it yourself. But ultimately, it's no good just telling someone, hey, I noticed you closed this many deals or you made this many calls. Yes, you can see them. They can see it themselves too. It's about giving meaning to that data. So what's the impact of making fewer calls or what, that, what, what is that going to lead to? So focusing on that as opposed to the data itself. So not discussing the data itself specifically on the call, but what is that going to lead to? Yeah, yeah that's good. And when it comes to listening to calls, I mean, you know, a lot of companies now are using call, call conversation intelligence tools, call recording, things like this. Mm -hmm. um, I think you mentioned before the call, you've got a team of 11 reps. Is that right? Or, or how many reps are in your team? Yes, between 11 and 13 at the moment. Yeah. Okay. How do, how do you, like, you, how, do, how many calls a week are you watching? And like, how do you find the time for this as well? Because I think this is a big challenge. Um, you know, we have all of these, these conversations recorded. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if you've got 13 reps and they're, an hour or even half an hour calls each or whatever, you know, how do you manage to, to get your head around? Um, or how, how do you manage to, to make enough time for this? Because I think this can also be super challenging. So you can use things like Gong, uh, of course, and then just setting time aside to listen to parts of, uh, let's, let's say calls that may be slightly more challenging. So filtering, through, you know, these, these look like interesting calls or just even picking some at random and going with that. Usually it's, either myself or the team leads as well. So it's something that's shared between among us. And that's something that we then discuss when we look at performance reviews and, and uh, yeah, one-to-ones for certain individuals. When we're planning those, we can, we can take different uh, points of view as well. It's no, no point uh, just me listening to one call and then just giving my perhaps biased feedback. Whereas if I have another member of the team listen to a different call and they say, hey, you know, this person may have missed something out on this call, but they sure covered it in another call. So kind of, having the team leads involved as well. Um, and then often just even asking the rep, like going through with the rep, like this is what I heard and I'd like to show you a fragment of that conversation and how would you do it better next time? Where, where do you feel like you went wrong? Um, just kind of, yeah, it, there's different ways on, in terms of going on about it. Yeah, no, that's super good. I mean, one more question then I end up with James, but do you, um, you know, how much, so do you do, how much um, do you document this? Like, do you write things down before the call? So you share an agenda with the rep beforehand or, mm -hmm. or do you kind of, or do you kind of surprise them in the session and catch them off guard? Like, how do you, how do you handle that? Cause it no, sounds like there's quite, a, quite a lot of work. So okay. yeah, prior to the call, they'd receive, well, the, the calendar invite would already have things that I'd like to cover during that call. And like I said, it will be to a point where people know what they should be preparing for, for the call. It doesn't come as a surprise to them. Yeah. Super good, super interesting. I mean, I just wanted to dig in because we've been working on, on a product in this space and I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, I, I've been doing a lot of product interviews on this topic anyway, so I guess uh, these questions are top of mind for me. Um, Why not? Yeah, su su super interesting to hear how you manage it, especially with like quite a big team um, of, of direct reports. Um, so James, what, what, what solutions do you um, have in mind for like, some of the challenges we discussed earlier? Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak to the, to the two the two groups here, I think that this is relevant to, and that's the leaders and the frontline reps, obviously the people that run teams. Um, there are way too many resources out there that are great resources for technique, tactics, tips, takeaways, things, actionable stuff that your sales reps can try and A, B test and split test things. Uh, it's a wealth of information out there and a really big percentage of it is free for all intents and purposes. So I think the, the, the big thing that I would say, the tool to use is all of the LinkedIn networks that are out there, the groups that are out there that share tactics and techniques, but don't just consume them. Become a channel for your reps to go get involved and or consume that information with you and then coach to put those into action consistently. If that's weekly, fine then do it weekly. If it's daily, fine, do it daily. Find the channel that works for daily and the mm -hmm. type of insights that you can deliver as a leader daily. But we have to become the conduit as a leader for tactics, techniques, things to try, helping somebody find that pragmatic approach 
that works for them and the ideal buyers that you're trying to impact. So I would say become very resourceful because there are an abundance of resources out there that you can draw from and really coach people to get that lifestyle that they're after. Make no mistake. Everybody that comes into sales that works underneath you, they're after a specific lifestyle. Learn what it is. Coach them to that. And you're going to develop, a one, a great, well-rounded seller. Two, somebody that believes in you as a leader. And they want to be loyal to you and see your team perform as a group. And you want to be that leader, the one that people look to and go, I've learned a lot from them. You could learn a lot from them too. Because that's a great strategy for you, for them, for your prospects, for your buyers, everybody. Huh. Yeah, that's super good. I really like the idea of the, the manager taking the responsibility to consume the content and then, and then feed it to the team in a meaningful way. I mean, there is, that's the thing about sales is there's so much great content out there. And I think it's the rep's responsibility to also be consuming this content, to be reading it. I mean, I can speak from my own experience. Like I'm basically a self-taught salesperson, as are most in the profession as well. Um, you know, I basically taught myself watching videos from you and John Barrow's winning by design, and, you know, these sorts of stuff that's all freely available and everything is there if you, if you take the time to read it. But I think the key here is getting the managers buy-in as well, um, helping them to interpret that, that, that content and apply it in your context for your buyer persona, for your, your um, you know, your buyer persona, your ideal customer. I think it's just so, so, so important and also making sure the manager is, you know, putting aside time and making making sure people have the time to work on this stuff because if you don't have, have to the managers... talk we have to talk to our people more if you are a leader working in a hybrid environment or a remote environment talking to your people is hard for you because we're detached we're not in the same room i can't turn my chair around and be like hey bill right <laughs> i can't do it i have to go to slack go to the direct message reach out to bill set a meeting get the time, respect Bill's time on his calendar, right? Like there, it's more of a process now. It's not as simple as just, you know, knock, knock on somebody's office door. Hey, you got a minute? Can I sit down? Can we talk real quick? I just have a few questions. That's not a thing anymore. Your questions come in writing form on Slack. They respond to you. No meeting has to happen, right? So we have to make effort to meet about meaningful shit, meaningful stuff, your career, your tactics, your results, the improvements we can make, places where you're shining, right? All of these things should be covered consistently with your people because that's how they invest in themselves. And they have to invest in themselves. If you have people on your team that are not taking steps to invest in themselves, that's a conversation you must have with them immediately. Because it's not your job to make them a successful salesperson. That responsibility is theirs. Yeah, like with anything in life, yeah. no one's just going to come and hand it to you on a silver plate. You need to go out and get it, right? Like you really Except want for... something, you need to put yourself out there. And, and just like you, Bowen, you went out there and you you picked up on what you needed to get the job done. Yeah. But I, I think as you're talking, I mean, I completely agree with all these things. I'm, I'm also thinking back, you know, I mentioned we've been doing a lot of research for this product and, and you know, overwhelmingly the feedback we're getting from people is that managers don't have the time. Um, don't have the time to prepare for the coaching sessions, don't have the time to um, consume the content themselves, to create formal training. A lot of the time they're handing this off to um, sales enablement uh, if they've got one or HR is probably the most common one we see actually. Um, maybe they don't have a sales enablement function. They're like, oh, that, that training thing, like that's something that HR does and which is complete bullshit because HR doesn't know how to sell or doesn't, uh, you know, it's like their responsibility to train your sales reps when they're not even in sales just doesn't make sense. But yeah, like, what do you, how do you, I mean, I, and I, you know, I think, but I also don't blame them. Like, you know, they're busy frontline manager. You're probably also selling yourself. You've got a big team. Like, but do you have any advice or any ideas how, how frontline managers can, can make time for this or can balance this along with other things that they're doing? Because I think it's very idealistic to assume that, you know, they're just going to, have the time to, to go through all this and do it. But yeah, but is there anything that you can think of how they might make time for this or, or be able to prioritize it for their teams? I, th I think people just need to realize like there's that old saying, right? Like take care of your people and they'll take care of the results. Uh, you need to be invested in their success. If you give them your time, if you give them the education, the training, the coaching that they need, the results will happen, will we'll take care of themselves. And if you're a manager, you know what you signed up for. Like this is what you signed up for. You need to find time and make it work. And uh, as James said in the chat, of course, time, time blocking is definitely one of the things that they can make good use of. 
My my tip for them would be to go out of your way to spend time one on one with your people and just get to know them better. Just get to know them better. Uh, hat tip to Zach Metters and Aaron Riley, formerly of Cirrus Insight. These guys would actually say to you, "Hey, you want to go? You want to go get lunch today?" And then it'd be it'd be on them. You know, they would cut. They would take you out to lunch as an SDR that was new. They would take you out to lunch. They would get to know you, ask about your family, your history, where you're from. They actually gave a shit about me as an employee. I was invested in their success just as much as I was invested in my own. And that right there changed everything about the way I felt about leadership in the past. Because I had two that actually cared and gave a shit about my success. And that's different. That's unique. We don't often see that. So you say, I don't have time to build a training. No one's asking you to allocate an entire Monday morning to start building this big, long training, even though you probably should. What we are saying is give some of your time to your team and they'll give you more time on the clock because they want to give you what you deserve as a leader because you treat them so damn well. It changed everything for me. I worked really hard for those guys and they saw it and they still talk about it today. I think that's, that's great. And I think it's, it's, Unfortunately, I think it's different to what, I, what I'm saying. Like I, I was just at Dreamforce and, and SAS the last week speaking to a lot of sales leaders and, and you know, the way that they're motivating their teams is setting higher targets in most cases. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe they're also doing this, but I think there seems to be a lot of kind of flogging the, flogging people for, to get more out of them as opposed to trying to tap into that intrinsic, intrinsic side. Um, I'm just looking at the time. We've got, and I also have a session immediately after, so I'd like to finish a few minutes early. Um, tools and strategies and, and like, I, yeah, tips are the two final topics. So, um, yeah, I mean, just to summarize everything we've talked about today, is there like, you know, one takeaway tip or, or one or, or tool or something that you, you'd really strongly recommend to help you here? Uh, so, so something that we do uh, at Lead Feeder, we have a, a weekly call with the whole inbound sales team. And during that call, we go through our, our promising deals. But again, not really focusing on stuff that's already in the CRM, like promising mm. deals you can already pick up with a report and so on, but more so looking at things like, you know, why did we win X deal last week? Or why did we lose X deal last week? What could we have done better? And, and then that way people can weigh in with their thoughts, uh, things that they could have done differently, and then ultimately give that person, whoever sharing, uh, something to think about, something to take away from other peers, but also their manager to weigh in with their uh, with their suggestion as well. And people then end up owning their mistakes. Uh, and, and like I said, people take away something that they can then apply to the next deal to prevent that from happening again. So yeah, having that common space or a call where people really open up as to what went well, but also what went wrong and what perhaps could be put right going forward. Um, and then for, for ma any managers listening as well, um, there might be a lot of things yeah. that you might pick up on someone. If you're coaching them on a regular basis, you might see you know, five or 10 things that this person needs to work on. But don't overwhelm them with so many things at once. Just focus on one topic or one focus area per month. Uh, make sure that's you know nailed and in, done and dusted, and then move on to the next one. It can be tempting to try and you know go with everything in one go, oh, and it doesn't do you any favors, and that person will more likely be overwhelmed uh, at the end of, end of the month. And and again, not great if 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 uh, you're working fully remotely. They're very junior. Uh, they can be demoralized and uh, feeling very unmotivated as well. That's great. Good stuff. Uh, can I, can I give like actual like heart, like software to go try and use that I know is effective because I use it. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, go for it, go for it. All right. So I'll, I'll give you guys a great list of stuff that I use and I'll tell you what I use it for briefly. And this will be a longer list, I guess, but it won't take me very long to run through them all. Uh, so I use Vidyard for video. Video impacts everybody that you talk to because a hundred percent of your communication can be used when you use video. So I send videos almost religiously. If I can, if I default to the video, I do it. Uh, I use Chili Piper for scheduling. It makes life really easy because people can schedule a call with me. Really simple. Uh, I use Sales Loft for my cadences. It makes it really easy to write up a good contact strategy and run through it. Uh, I use Reprise for any demo situation because I can do it interactive and just give people the product and say, go for it. Uh, and I love there's, there's a few tools that are probably a little more obscure, but Lead IQ, I use Lead IQ and, or Zoom Info. Both of those have great tools for contact information. Uh, so you should check those tools out. 
Uh, and then I just learned about this one, and this one's one that you can go try for absolutely for free. It's called True Commish. True Commish will help track your commissions so that your leadership, your team, your company doesn't miss out on payments that you should have got. This is a free thing that you can go do right now, truecommish.com. Check it out. I think it's T-R-U-C-O-M-M-I-S-H.com. There's no E in true, true commish. Uh, but that's a, great, that's a great free thing that you can go check out right now. Cool. Nice. Nice tech stack. Uh, I guess from my side, I went, um, I think it was a small, a small plug, not too shameless. I mean, you know, I think this has been super interesting talking about this because this is um, exactly the sorts of problems we're trying to solve at, at Wonderway. Um, you know, I mentioned that we're doing research. We've been working on this product. Um, we're trying to solve a lot of these problems that we've talked about, um, you know, how do sales managers get an overview of all the different data that that's available with all, between all the different tools, how do they prioritize their time, um, how do they um, focus on the key things that matter? And then, you know, what training can they use to then help people if they don't have the time to necessarily do this themselves? So this product's still under development. I'm, we're, we're still working on it, but I'm, I'm super, if anyone on the call would like to, to catch up and talk about these things, um, you know, either to share input on the product development process or check out what we're doing, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this has been super interesting. As I said before, we're doing research around these topics. So I think this has been interesting from like a, a, um, a, a academic perspective for me to get input on, on these challenges and also um, super relevant, I'm sure, for everyone that's here. So um, thanks so much for your time. I think in terms of the next sessions, um, we don't have time for Q&A, unfortunately, but um, please follow us all on LinkedIn. Uh, I think everyone here has got a big following, James, just slightly bigger than mine, um, but <laughs> we're working on it. So please make sure you follow me and Deepak so we can catch up to James. Uh, and uh, up next, there's two, <laughs> two sessions. Two sessions that are starting straight after this. Um, so we've got a case study from Validity around how they reduced um, SDR turnover. And we've got a session um, with sales leaders talking about the biggest challenges um, that are, they're facing this year. So um, I think Nazar is dropping the links in the chat. Um, please jump into whichever session uh, you're more interested in. Um, and, and if you're joining the sales leaders one, I'll see you in the next session. But Thank you so much, James. Thank you, Deepak. Um, super, super, super interesting session. And yeah, great to spend time with you both today. Likewise, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We'll see you at the next session. Next session. Cheers. See ya. Bye. See you guys.